And with that, I would like to start with uh, my own report. And um, I would like to get started by, you know, it's, a, it's kind of a sad duty of the director to talk about the members that we lost this past year. Um, these are friends of the AVSO. These are people who left part of their legacy uh, with us. These are members. These are observers. Uh, and we lost four members and four friends last year. One of them was uh, Dr. Belserine, who was the director of the Maria Mitchell Observatory. She was a professional astronomer working in RLIR stars in globular cluster. Uh, Mr. Aldrich, Mr. Aldrich became a member in 2012, and he loved his 17-inch telescope, and he was using it a lot for uh, public outreach. He didn't have time. He didn't manage to submit observations. He was getting himself trained with choice courses in order to, to keep himself up to speed, and we lost him really suddenly. And then Mr. Middlemist, who was um, actually a founding, a co-founder of the Northern Western Association of Variable Star Observers, which is part of the British Astronomical uh, Association right now, uh, and he submitted, we're talking about more than 45,000 visual observations at the, at the database. Um, Professor Mercedes Richards, Professor Richards was a good friend, really good friend. I met her when I was in graduate school. And I didn't know she was sick, so we lost her really suddenly. She was a pioneer in Doppler tomography of algal systems. Uh, and actually, she was working on a, a 3D uh, Doppler tomography code. Um, I can't say enough about Mercedes. She made a big change in uh, variable, professional variable stars to fix what we know about algals. Absolutely amazing person. Um, with that, I would like you to join me in a moment of silence, please, in remembrance and in memory of those members. Thank you. So I would like to start by remembering or reminding us all where we started from and where we are right now. And we started as a group of observers about 100 years ago in Cambridge, Massachusetts, at the Harvard Observatory. And right now, we are quite international. We're all over the world. We're talking about 1,000 members, about one to 2,000 observers at all times that are trying to understand and study and have fun with variable star observations. Um, we are a collective, pretty much. We're everywhere. Uh, and this is actually a big, powerful tool for uh, uh, variable star astrophysics. And the reason why we're doing what we're doing is because we believe we want to enable anyone, anywhere, to participate, be active in variable star astrophysics uh, and in the scientific discovery. This is our core mission. How many of you know the, our core mission? Yeah, nice. So people who are, this is a really very difficult task. It's not really easy. We have far too many, we've had too many components. We're very ambitious. We want to be modern. We need to be up to speed. And as you heard uh, from from um, Gary and from Bill, there are some very difficult discussions that are happening uh, through our council meetings, junior council meetings, with our council in order to make sure that not only we're relevant now and we're serving you well, but we will be relevant in 10 years from now, in 50 years from now, in 100 years from now. So we're, we're giving vision and direction to the AVSO. Um, so at this point, I think it's actually fair to introduce our council members to you who are actually volunteers. These are people who are spending their own time and resources to actually uh, sit down and, uh, and brainstorm about where the AVSO is going. It's, it's our think tank, and it's my left, right hand, top, bottom, etc. And uh, this year, Chris Larson is our president. She has a PhD in physics. She's a professor of physics. Talk to her about solar observations. Absolutely fantastic solar observer. Uh, Roger Coleman, our first VP, he is uh, a PhD in physics. Kevin Marvel, he's our second VP. He's an astronomy PhD, and actually he's the executive director of the American Astronomical Society, our sister society. Um, Gary Walker is our secretary. Heard about Gary? Did you know that he, well, he has a, a, a master's in, in mechanical and aeronautical engineering? Very accomplished person. Bill Goff, he's our treasurer. He has a, a psychology. I guess you have to be a psychologist in order to be a treasurer, right? <laughs> but he's one of the most tech-savvy 
people I know, an absolutely fantastic observer. You have to see his observations, fantastic. Jenna Sokolowski, he, he is a, she is a past president. Um, you heard from Jenna at the annual meeting. Uh, she's rotating of council this fall. Uh, great contributions, though, in, uh, in astronomy, big friend of the ABSO. And these are our council members. Uh, Katrin Kohlenberg, she is an astronomer, professional astronomer. Uh, Richard Sabo, he is a medical doctor. Richard is a real doctor. He can save your life. I cannot. So let's, let's give to you where you uh, belong. He's also a member of the American College of Surgeons. He's a fellow uh, for, at the American College of Surgeons. And yes, this is a big deal, just in case you're wondering. Barbara Heiss, she is a, a doctor, a real doctor, a medical doctor. She also has an MBA. Who does that? Really? Very accomplished lady. Uh, and a great observer. I mean, all of them are fantastic observers. Joyce Guzik, you heard from Joyce yesterday. She's a professional astronomer. Uh, Joe Patterson, he's a professional astronomer as well. Uh, Bill Stein, he has an astronomy PhD. He's a professional astronomer. Aaron Price, you know Aaron. He was uh, actually born and raised in principle at the AVSO. Uh, and he is a PhD in uh, learning science. And this is Caroline, his uh, six-year-old daughter, who's going to be your director 30 years from now. Um, <laughs> and with that, um, these are our council members. Most of them are here. Talk to them. Brainstorm with them. They want to hear from you. We're getting, in principle, these are members of, of the AVSO because we want to be directed by our membership. What you guys want, what where you think uh, our priorities should be, where you think we should be in 20 years from now, knowing your interests and the professional astronomy landscape. And with that, I'd like to transition to my boring director's report, uh, which is going to Produce, uh, provide a progress report for the AVSO, some research highlights, it's fun to see light curves, right? Um, a little bit about how we support our observers and uh, where their next meeting is, and I'm going to leave you with some final thoughts. And let me start by talking to you about our membership, our members. How are we tracking? So this histogram presents our members for six years now, um, seven actually, if you include 2016, and more or less our membership is flat. And I hear questions from time to time, uh, people asking, well, how many are new members and how many are old members? And this plot actually presents exactly that. So the red top part is pretty much all our members with time. This blue line down here shows our new members, how they track with time. And here is pretty much the net, uh, old minus new. Um, so pretty much this shows that our members, the number of members is more or less the same every year for the last five years. Where our members come from? This is where it becomes very interesting. This uh, pie chart shows pretty much the top 10 countries where people are coming from, and then there's a little part that shows other. Most of our members actually come, come from the United States. Uh, we have a big representation here in the US, and then we have people from Canada, Australia, UK, well, Europe, all over, um, and a small amount other. Now, how about our observers? Uh, it's very interesting to see what our observers were doing in 2016. This is only 2016, and actually it's January, February, and March, first quarter of 2016. And it's actually a pleasure to see that lots of people, most people, are actually doing visual observing. Visual observing is super important for variable star astrophysics for the simple reason there are so many really bright stars out there that are doing crazy stuff. And you can observe bright stars with your eyes through binoculars through a telescope. This is a skill set I don't want to see going away from the ABSO. And I know I talked to many of you at this meeting. I do have a pair of binoculars. I was always planning to do something with them. Haven't done anything. So personal commitment. I'm going to submit 20 observations by the annual meeting. Let's see. Binocular observations. So let's see how that works. Uh, you can actually check the quality of my data. It's going to be on the AID. But uh, by the annual meeting, I'm going to start doing that. Uh, then uh, we had a 27% observing with uh, CCDs. The SLR is increasing at 5%. This is, again, three months, right, in 2016. Uh, DSLR is increasing. We have some PEP observers, which I really like seeing because these are bright stars, very accurate measurements, absolutely fantastic data. You have to see that data. And uh, we have some observers who are doing visual observations through digital video. Uh, where do they come from? 
most, again, this is top 10, and 23% is miscellaneous. Most of our observers come from the United States, with a, a second from uh, UK and Spain. So it's very interesting, isn't it? And then we have people from Canada, Germany, France, Hungary, Italy, etc. This is 2016. So I think we, we should count weather in there as well. Uh, it was winter, right? Um, so, uh, and we have a 23% from other countries. We have 60 uh, observers from 60 countries. It's a, a really pretty much international community of observers that we have. Um, so all those people are taking data. What do we do with the data? What I have here is a pie chart of where data downloads come from. Uh, these are, again, top 10 countries. So about the 10% comes from the US. Um, I have to say that this pie chart is populated based on what people told us uh, when they're downloading the data. So there are lots of uh, people that did not provide information. So there's some information that is missing. So a disclaimer right away. But we have uh, about a 10% from the US, another 10% from Japan. Isn't that interesting? And we have a very close from the UK. And these are the top three. And then you see a 55% uh, in the other. We have downloads from about 40 countries. This 55% includes a 35% of people that we cannot track because they did not provide the information. Um, so those people download data from our database that right now has more than 30.5 million data points from about, uh, populating about actually more than 25,000 light curves. So we're talking about a treasure chest of information. There's a reason why the stars are called variable. They're changing with time and they're changing rapidly. So every new information is pro providing new aspects of their variability. Um, and it is in this, uh, in this particular uh, graph. And I, I, I'm hoping I'm going to see some milestones actually being hit in 2016. Um, so some research highlights. Uh, what we do with this data, what this data represents. In 2016 alone, three months, first quarter, we had 12 alerts and 10 special notices. And a reminder, those alerts and special notices are actually targets that are we get uh, requests that we get from professional astronomers for targets of interest, either because something really exciting is happening or because they have time with uh, a satellite, so they need ground-based support, or they have time with a big telescope doing spectroscopy or any other way of observing radio, for example, et cetera, et cetera, and they're desperate for a light curve. Again, these, are, these stars are variable. If you don't know what they're doing, um, then the information, I mean, if you don't have a light curve, then the information that you have through other means is incomplete. So professional astronomers really need us. And as I said, first quarter right now, we have, uh, we have 22 notifications from professional astronomers wanting data from us. and um, I'd like to start showing you some of that data um, by starting with a really fun object that uh, actually created lots of noise last year. This is uh, the 404 SIG. Um, it went, this is a, a binary with a black hole sucking the life out of its giant companion, but went through a very rare and very exciting outburst last summer. This outburst is here. Uh, and of course, professional astronomers went crazy. They started requesting light curves and requesting data, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of excitement in there. Uh, V404SIG uh, had a hiccup right before it went behind the sun. Of course, right? Right, right? Um, <laughs> it went behind the sun. It came out. Uh, and it's doing something really bizarre there until it went back to quiescence. But the reason why I'm mentioning this is because as a result of all this excitement and as a result of data, a nature paper was produced. And not only a nature paper, three different press releases, one of which came out of the American Astronomical Society, and four of our members actually were past, part of this, uh, of this paper. It's Bill Goff, uh, Bill Stein, Mike Christman, and uh, Luke Cook. I don't, I'm not there. I don't need to be there. I don't have to be there, really. This is your work, and this is how you're acknowledged. And I would like to announce that we are actually preparing a, a review manuscript uh, the PI is in the UK. He's the one who is actually trying to compile all the data. 60 of our observers, every single person who contributed to that campaign is going to be in that paper. As simple as that. So um, 
getting credit for our work is something that we do want to see, right? We do want to see our name in papers as we see light curves. And we're trying to make sure that servers are getting credit for their work as much as possible. Another object of interest, especially in 2016, is this one, stick or bore. And tick or bore is a symbiotic sort of object, so it has a giant, a white dwarf that's secreting from a giant, it looks like that, and it's actually an old nova. Tick or bore was reported to go nova um, sometime in 1866, and then again in 1946, and then it was doing pretty much nothing. This is a plot that Sarah Beck from headquarters created for us, uh, and it pretty much shows all the data that we have, um, in one day means, it's, these are visual data, most of them are visual data. CCD data starts about here. And you can see the uh, 1946 uh, eruption. And if you zoom in this part of the light curve, it seems that it's sort of doing something. So black points here are visual data, the averages of visual data. And then um, the green points are uh, CCD data and then R and I, and this down here is B. And in B, it seems that it's sort of creeping up. So there is a campaign going on right now. We have no idea what's going on with the tick or bore. The professional community is getting excited. Uh, all kinds of data are streaming in, all kinds of discussions. So I would like to actually put that star in your radar because maybe it's going for another explosion. Maybe it's just teasing us. No one really knows what's happening. Uh, the fact, though, is that it is two magnitudes brighter in B, and it hasn't been that bright for at least the last 30 years. People who are observing that um, have notified us. Another interesting source is B Persei, and this is a project that started about uh, three years ago. Uh, B Persei is a very, very bright star. It's a, it's a known double. It's a, a, a day and a half orbital period of the double, and serendipitously, it was discovered to have a third component. So it's a third star that is pretty much eclipsing the main binary. So this is pretty much a model or, uh, that is coming out of a picture of how the star looks like. Um, and the period of that particular triple is 700 days. So every 700 days, a third component is sort of eclipsing the main binary. So two years ago, we had a campaign. Uh, we're asking for observations. And this is pretty much the results from two years ago. And you can see that the, the data are not exactly conclusive for what the model was, well, uh, at the beginning of this year, the same team requested data from the AVS so in order to nail down the geometry of the binary. And this is the result of, uh, of our work. It is in the hands of the PIs. We're looking forward to seeing uh, the model. But this is a beautiful, beautiful light curve that reflects both the, binary, the primary binary component and the eclipse by the third object. Um, changing gears again. This is an absolutely fantastic story here. How many of you remember Epsilon Origa? Epsilon Origa is a, a, a giant that was eclipsed by a thing every 27 years. So uh, we had a campaign, had actually a citizen science project to, to capture that eclipse that lasted for about two years. This star uh, was part of the KELT database. Uh, and you heard a little bit about KELT yesterday, uh, and pretty much it was discovered to be doing nothing until it started doing something, as in it dropped in brightness. And this is pretty much the KELT limit, observing limit. So they actually notified the AVSO to take data and try to figure out how deep uh, the, that eclipse, how deep that, um, that drop was. Uh, pretty much it goes all the way down to 15. So there are AVSO data here starting from this, um, this timeline all the way up. So. This is a three-year time period. This is from 2007 going all the way to 2015. So the PI, who is uh, Joey Rodriguez, um, came to Cambridge, and he went to Harvard to look for archival data in Harvard plates. And he actually managed to find this star in Harvard plates. And this is what the star was doing. This is the full light curve that was recovered from 1900 all the way to now. This is the eclipse that is actually reflected down here. And he found there was another eclipse around the 1940s, another eclipse of the system. So pretty much, there was one eclipse that started in 1942, more or less, and went until 45. 
and another one 2011-2015. And you get a, a phase like curve of this object. Um, you get something like this. So the picture that emerged out of this study, and actually this was a press release, is that you have a giant that is eclipsed by a thing. And the thing this time is a stellar remnant, something that looks like a giant, but it looks like a strip giant star, uh, and a disk. Uh, the period based on these two eclipses is about 70 years, 69.1 years. The duration is 3.45 years, and the drop in brightness is about 4 to 5 magnitudes. This is an object that nobody actually expected that it would be an eclipsing binary. And actually right now, this is entering the Guinness World Record of the longest eclipse uh, the longest eclipsing binary, the longest duration of the eclipse, the longest drop. It's, it's absolutely phenomenal research that is coming out of uh, monitoring of objects like that. But for me, the way that I see it is it's also a lesson. Think about it. If we had only this, so yeah, this, the thing is sort of an eclipsing binary. And we're asking for observations. And somebody started observing the star in 1970. And observe it again and again and again, boring, 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 doing absolutely nothing. Chances are that after two, three, four, ten years, you would give up. But this time period is actually 70 years. So if you give up, you don't produce more data. You don't produce more, da more data. You don't populate a light curve that actually is in need of being populated in order to be able to catch an object when it's doing something really special. So. If the star is a suspected variable, if it's not being observed, then it's like it's not variable, it doesn't exist at all. We really need data, and we really need long-term likers of objects like that in order to be able to understand their nature. There's chances that there are lots of eclipsing binaries like that. And one of Joy's work is actually to try to see whether there are other objects like this in the KELT database uh, and or in any other database so that they can act he can actually provide us with um, with uh, targets. Um, so when you're observing a variable star and you don't see it doing anything exciting, it's not exploding, it's not eclipsing necessarily at the time you're observing it, please keep it in your database, please keep it in your queue because you never know how your data are going to be used in 10, 20, 50 years from now. We're building projects that are of interest to professional astronomers now and we are providing data that will be of interest to professional astronomers 50 years from now. That is the value of the ABSO. That is the value of the database. Uh, with that, I would also want to have a call for observations. The next eclipse is going to be 2080. Um, please stay tuned. We're going to have an alert. Um, and by that time, maybe I will have a bigger telescope to observe it myself. It will last for three years. It's going to be a citizen science project, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so this is just a small, um, a small number of projects that are in the works right now, uh, most of them in 2016. You can see projects that were done by DSLR observers like the Beta uh, B per, it's not corrected, by visual observers like the London Liker or t core Bore, by CCD observers like uh, V404C. Everybody has a home at the AVS, so everybody belongs here with any means of observing that you'd like. The main idea is for objects to be observed and for objects to be, uh, for light curves to be accumulated, being built up. I keep saying it, I will keep saying it. They're called variables because they're changing. And for most of them, you have no idea what they're going to do next. And that's the beauty of it, that's the fun of it. Uh, this actually plot is tracking uh, the number of our observations that appear in, uh, in professional publications. These are peer-reviewed manuscripts without counting newsletters, uh, uh, posters, it doesn't count posters, it doesn't count other presentations in conferences, et cetera, et cetera. And there's an upward turn right there. Uh, here, uh, we will start this year to actually track separately uh, publications that publish APAS data from those that publish light curves. So we'll try to see how they track more or less. Um, these previous data uh, uh, include both. So I, I hope to have something different to report to you in the annual meeting. Now changing gears for a minute, um, 
one of the things that the ABSO is doing, and one of the things that the ABSO is charged to do, is train our observers. Make sure that you have the tools you need to have in order to do the best work uh, you can do with the means that you have. And one of the, the ways that we can do that is through our observing sections. And our observing sections have been underpopulated, it's a little bit dormant um, the last several years, but we're trying to kind of revamp them a little bit and re-energize them. And one of them has to do with long period variables, these long period pulsators. So we've been doing a lot of work on the relevant web page. We have a new administrator who is uh, Andrew Pierce. He's down in Australia. Uh, two um, assistant administrators, Michael Sukup and Frank Shore, and Owen, who is doing a fantastic job in the in the uh, web page. Um, we also have some proposed targets, both in the northern and the southern hemisphere. If you want to start observing one of those and you're wondering which stars are in need of observation, this would be a very good place to start. You're going to see more targets coming up in this particular observing section. We're also planning to have an LPV of the month. So every month or a couple of months, we're going to have information a different star. And for that, we would definitely appreciate uh, everyone's help if you'd like to actually provide Write something, write the paragraph about your favorite star, your favorite LPV. Please uh, join us, let me know. Uh, we'd love to hear from the community. This is something, um, each star is, uh, is special. Although they belong in one category, they're doing something different most of the times. So it will be nice to learn more about those stars. Uh, another observing section that we're really actively working on right now is exoplanets. And exoplanets are in the news, are everywhere. Everybody's investing on observing exoplanets one way or another. TESS is coming up. Um, in 2017, they will start uh, producing data. We're talking about monitoring 200,000 of the brightest stars in the night sky for exoplanet transit. And most of the things that they're interested in are exo-Earths, and most of the things they're going to be finding is hot Jupiters because they're very really frequent. That's what's going, going on. And all those hot Jupiters will produce excellent signs and we will need observations. So people will be coming to the AVSO for support. They will be coming to the AVSO for observing. And our job is, again, to produce um, means for our observers to be well equipped in order to observe those transits and produce data that are useful for the researchers now and useful for the researchers in 30 years from now. So this is the main idea of this uh, exoplanet section. We already, oh, Dennis Conti actually is chairing it, and you heard from Dennis uh, at the Woburn meeting. He's going to be, I hope, he's going to be at the annual meeting this year as well. I'll tell you more about it. Um, we've already produced some first targets if you want to get your hands dirty. They're challenging, especially for our CCD observers. They're very challenging. Uh, we're also providing transit times in 2016 based on the ephemers that we know. So if you want to observe an exoplanet transit, take a look at this list and uh, take a look at the um, times of transit and then send us the data. We also have an AVSO, an exoplanet manual that has more information on how to observe this kind of, uh, of uh, objects. Um, I, wanna, I don't want to say more because we're going to be discussing the exoplanets for meetings to come uh, and hopefully showcasing some science, but for now, Please take a look at that and try it. Um, this is a challenge for our um, CCD observers mostly. I have a challenge for those who want to do bright stuff. And I talked about this collaboration in the fall meeting as well last year. And I'll keep talking about it because this is really key science. I talked about the bright constellation uh, last year. And bright is a group of satellites that are pretty much toaster size. This is a technician at the lab actually working on one of the satellites. So we're talking about, just imagine a toaster that you have at home. This is the site of the satellite itself. And they're studying um, the brightest star in the night sky, stars that have names, Rachel, you name it, Vega. Um, they're studying them for uh, astroseismology, and they're studying them for anything and everything else that's happening in there. Um, and they're desperate for ground-based support. They're desperate for data from the ground. Uh, this is a collaboration of about 300 scientists from all over the world, and there are only five satellites, and they're observing one star at a time. 
So they're getting time on their startup preference for 50 days, maybe, until the satellite goes and does something else. So what happens before and after? I was, I was hoping that we would, we would actually contribute in the before and after. So here we have a, a list of targets uh, that the Bright team requested from AVSO observers to observe. They have priorities. You, you're not meant to read that. Which one? Yeah, this is, it is on the web page. That's why I, I, didn't, I didn't highlight anything. But just letting you know how it looks like. Uh, the first column has a, a star name, uh, RA deck uh, magnitude. So you see a three, four. This is Beta Lyra. Um, this is Vega. Where's Vega? It was here. It's Vega, Alpha Lyra. We're talking about this kind of stars here. People are asking for both photometry and spectra. Spectroscopy is not something that we're doing right now. If you'd like to provide spectra, here's the contact information of the APIs at the very end of this list. Please send them directly to them for now. Um, this is really challenging because they're asking for 1% to 5% accuracy in photometry. So these are fantastic targets for PEP observers. You have a photoelectric photometer somewhere? Please get it out of the storage. We really need data with that. Uh, and this is actually great. Uh, these are great targets for DSLR observers. And visual data. I mean, in principle, they're putting uh, here requirements. But if you ask anyone in there, they will take any data we can produce. Any data is, is usable data. OK? Yes. Are they only interested in data of these stars around these epochs of observing? They're interested in long-term light curves at any epoch. So these are targets that are relevant. These, are, these targets are up this time of the year. There's a different one for the Northern Hemisphere winter. Yes. So. And you actually want visual observations as well? Yes, we do. Because what if, you know, what if one of those shows a, a super flare? So I, I don't trust stars anymore. They're all varying. Um, <laughs> so with that, I would like to announce that uh, there's a new DSLR manual. Mark uh, Blackford was working really hard to provide some updates on our DSLR manual. And I'd like to remind you that uh, Arnis CCD School is online. If you'd like to actually um, purchase chapters of this school, the, you can actually um, get the whole school, the whole school, uh, if you want to, or chapters of the school to refresh your uh, skills. That's an option there. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about the Egan Car project, but you, you heard uh, a lot from George Silvis. Uh, I'd like you to go to the webpage actually of this project to see all this wonderful work that is done. George produced a four-minute YouTube video on how uh, the Egan Star Project is going on. So uh, please take a look at it. It's just four minutes. It's absolutely fantastic. It's a quick and dirty way of uh, working on Egan Stars. Um, and we're hoping that it's going to be completed at the end of this year. Uh, all those things and even more you're supporting when you are produce, you're giving us uh, money in the annual campaign. Um, we are a nonprofit. We're doing what we're doing for free. Uh, in principle, for everybody. Everybody has access to most of the things that we're doing. And we are relying on our member support for that. So our annual campaign is going on. Uh, Mike Simons is up there. He will be very happy to take your money. And we'll be very grateful for your support. Um, and with that, our annual meeting in 2016, it's going to happen November uh, 10 to 12. Yes, it is bright time. It's not observing time. For complaints, and this time it's going to be at the Burlington Mary, Burlington, Massachusetts. Um, it's uh, outside Boston. It's uh, it's a better area, I think. There are more restaurants around the hotel. There are more things to do, so I think you're going to like it more. Um, but of course, we're welcoming feedback. So I hope to see you in uh, Mass in uh, Boston in November. And uh, with that, pretty much, I'm ending my report. But I would like to leave you with with some final thoughts here. Um, hmm. Earlier this year, professional astronomers announced a, a star from the Kepler, uh, the Kepler campaign, like the original Kepler database. 
you heard about Kepler yesterday. And this is one of those, you know, it was staring at the same part of the sky for four years in a row. And this is the light curve of the star. So it was doing pretty much nothing, nothing, nothing. This is time, by the way, uh, on the horizontal axis from the beginning of, of Kepler observations in days. So it was doing nothing, 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 and then deep for two days. Nothing, 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 and then deep, 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 and then Kepler moved on. And professional astronomers went there and they're like, oh, that's an eclipse. No, it's not an eclipse. This is not looking like an eclipse. This definitely does not look like an eclipse. So what is it? But guess what? Kepler is off to something else. Um, and who is going to be, who's going to keep observing it? So the PI of that group uh, actually notified us, Tabi um, Boyajan, and we got on the star right away. We are taking data. Pretty much doesn't do anything. But Tabi also produced a TED talk. And I would like to encourage you to go take a look at her talk. Uh, but for now, for our benefit, I'd like to just um, share with you some of her final thoughts of that talk. And what she said is, we need to continue to observe this star to learn more about what's happening. But professional astronomers like me, we have limited resources for this kind of thing. And Kepler is on to a different mission. And I'm happy to say that once again, citizen scientists have come in and saved the day. You see, this time, amateur astronomers with a backyard telescope stepped up immediately and started observing this star nightly at their own facilities. And I'm so excited to see what they find. This is what we are about. We're about unveiling the mysteries of the universe any way we can. And we are about understanding the mechanics of weird stars or not so weird stars, mechanics of stars nonetheless. Um, our job at the AVSO is to make sure that you guys have the tools to do the best job that you can provide, to, to acquire the data in the best way you can. Um, and this is pretty much part of our mission. This is what you're supporting when you're supporting us. And pretty much this is part of the party, trying to, to get the best data that we can for variable star observing. So with that, I will stop. I would like to thank you for your attention and answer any more questions you might have. I left you speechless. <laughs> A AVS or photometric or sky survey. Bright stars, bright stars are easy to get in the spectroscope. Would that be good simultaneous observation? Yes. Please and thank you. The beauty of the AVSO uh, observations is that um, someone is observing a star at any time. So even if you don't have a, a CCD camera that is doing photometry right, right next to your spectrograph, chances are, and actually you can coordinate with someone else, take photometry on an object that you're observing spectroscopically. And you have both, whoa, yes. More questions? So if there are no more questions, I would like to move on to a different part of business, and that is to acknowledge, um, to celebrate our members who have completed 25 years of membership. Uh, 25 years, a quarter of a century. So a quarter of a century is quite a loyalty uh, at the AVSO. And uh, we have three members who are present this time. Uh, here at the meeting, I would like to present them with their 25-year AVSO ping. Uh, this is alphabetical order, so the first one is Wayne Clark. Is Wayne? Could you come up, please? Uh, yay! <laughs> The second one is Horace Smith. Twenty-five years, Professor Smith. One more year, and I'll be the 
Ah, that's <laughs> true. Congratulations and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And the third person is Professor Leanne Wilson. Thank you. Ah, just two years from 40, excellent. Um, and the second part, actually, I would like to call uh, Christine Larson. The second part actually celebrates our observers, celebrates your work, celebrates milestones that our observers have reached through all this hard work. Uh, we're talking about this year, we're going to celebrate um, pretty much all kinds of observers that are, that are provided data or hit milestones with all kinds of observing modes. So we have visual observers, photographic, photovisual, CCD, PEP, DSLR, and VSDIG. Um, this is the physical year 2015. So if you don't see your name there, uh, it's because you did not hit that milestone by the end of September 2015. As simple as that. I know that some people hit that milestone in this room, hit a milestone a little bit after that. But the first person I would like to acknowledge is Chris Larson, who actually <laughs> got her 100 Visual Variable Star certificate this year. So Yay. congratulations, Chris. <laughs> it's our president, ladies and gentlemen. And with that. So our first is for David Turner. This is for over 1,000 visual variable star observations. David? Our next is for Mark Harris for over 1,000 visual variable star observations. For David Turner, for over a thousand photographic or photovisual variable star observations. For Bob Mansky, for over one thousand digital single lens reflex variable star observations. Bob, you here? Oh, okay. Well, thank him anyways. All right. Ah, Horace Smith for over 1,000 charge couple device variable star observations. William Pellegrin for over 1,000 charge couple device variable star observations. I'm going to hopefully not butcher your name. Marco Siaco? Siaco? for our over 1,000 charge couple device variable star observations. <laughs> David Kowal for over 1,000 charge couple device variable star observations. For his invaluable contribution of over 50,000 charge couple device variable star observations, Gary Walker. For his invaluable contribution of over 200,000 charge couple device variable star observations, Richard Sabo.
so everyone will receive a certificate. We're going to send it to, to them from headquarters. And uh, there's one more category. So uh, hopefully you have all been reading all of the wonderful communication from HQ, including the newsletters and the bulletins. And in my very first president's um, blurb in the newsletter, I issued a challenge to the membership to do some visual observing with binoculars and to qualify for the Astronomical League Binocular Variable Star Pin. Is there anyone uh, who is working on that challenge? Okay. Is there anyone here who has completed the challenge but after I issued it, Michael? Yes, anyone besides Rich? So, Rich Glaster, please come forward. We have a small token of appreciation for you. And the challenge is still on if you'd like to get involved. And no, this means that I have also not quite completed my own challenge yet. But. And after we've completed the binocular challenge, we will move on to the larger Astronomical League variable star observing pin. Right, Rich? That's right. Thank you, Christine. So at this point, um, this concludes our membership meeting. Uh, we have a very interesting talk after a short coffee break. So let's stretch our legs. And thank you very much for your attention. We really appreciate it.